Michael, you first. Well, thanks, Sheila. It's good to see so many people here this morning. I'm going to make five basic points about China and climate change, both to understand what they're doing at home and how that relates to how they engage with the rest of the world. Uh, the first, I think, is obvious to everyone here. There's no solution to climate change without China. China is responsible for about 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it is projected to account for about half of the increase in global emissions through 2030. It was 10% of global emissions in 1990. It's about 20% today, like I said. It's projected to be 30% if it goes along business as usual by 2030. Uh, it's also essential to a global solution because of concerns about competitiveness. If emissions are reduced, if emissions are regulated in much of the world but not in China, uh, some emissions creating activities will relocate to China. That's an overstated claim sometimes, but there is some truth to it. And regardless of the substantive truth in it, uh, it's widely believed, which means that to be s for emissions cutting efforts in developed countries to be politically sustainable, there need to be strong and visible efforts from China as well. Uh, the second basic point is that China is doing considerably more than a lot of people in this country assume or believe when it comes to climate change. Uh, they released their first national plan for dealing with climate change in 2007. It was a serious plan. It was a comprehensive plan. And it was a useful foundation for discussing the issues. Without a basic idea of a broad strategy, it's very difficult to engage a country on this issue. We've seen that, for example, with India, where there isn't a particularly coherent national climate strategy. So it's been difficult to have particularly substantive discussions. I won't go through all the things that were in that, but there are some basics that are important. It set a goal, uh, they set, the goal was set earlier and reiterated there, of cutting uh, emissions and uh, sorry, energy intensity, energy used to produce a unit of GDP by 20% during the 11th five-year plan. They won't make that goal, but they'll come a considerable way. It's backed by a series of specific uh, policies, for example, promoting more efficient coal plants, increasing vehicle fuel efficiency, uh, removing fuel subsidies, as uh, some of these have been developed, uh, policies have been developed over time, uh, and financial incentives for efficiency in heavy industry. So really a range of different, uh, different policies. Uh, the other important thing is that it, even though there is a climate strategy there, uh, it wasn't done for the sake of climate. It was done because there are a series of incentives that exist in China that, on, that quite frequently do line up with steps that are good for climate change. There are public health considerations and need to reduce local air pollution. Uh, there are economic incentives, particularly on the efficiency front, uh, increasing the efficiency of industry, of power generation, of vehicles, uh, but also on the economic front when it comes to creating an environment for developing advanced technologies that might be exported, uh, and also in shifting away from some of the uh, heavy industry, export-oriented heavy industry, which is very capital intensive, but not very labor intensive, and for a government that cares about employment, uh, is not necessarily the most useful thing. Uh, there's a third place where the incentives sometimes align, and that's on security, particularly in moving away from imported oil and to some extent uh, reducing reliance on imported gas. So I've just, I've just tried to explain a bit about why China is doing more than a lot of people believe. Now let me tell you why China is doing less than a lot of people claim as well. Uh, firstly, targets are targets. They're not outcomes. And while they're useful for guidance, in a lot of cases, China has great difficulty both getting the policies in place to meet those targets, but also following through on those policies, especially when they need strong administrative or enforcement capacity to follow up. You can, I can tick off a whole host of areas, for example, efficiency in buildings. Uh, I can look at another uh, area that gives, uh, where there's really solid evidence on the environmental front. China's been very successful at getting uh, power plants to install uh, scrubbing equipment, but not very successful in getting them to actually operate it. And ultimately, it doesn't have much of an impact if you have one but not, but not the other. Um, there's also a lot of hype about how China is eating our lunch on clean technology. And uh, by the way I, I describe that, you can, you can see something about what I think of it. Uh, I think there are a few misunderstandings underlying it. Firstly, it confuses their production of equipment with their use of it. Just because you're producing solar panels does not mean that you are using them. Uh, it also is due in part to us being a bit overwowed by big numbers. All numbers in China are big. So when China is making a lot of wind farms, a lot of solar panels, a lot of this, and that it doesn't necessarily mean that it is up to the task that uh, we need to have met. Um, and the other is on the innovation front. 
a lot of the time where China is really moving is on the manufacturing side. They are producing a lot. But if you look at the innovation side, if you look at patents, for example, and a lot of the clean technology areas, they are not in China. They are not being produced in China. And so there is still that divide. Let me say a couple quick words now about how this intersects with the international level. Because I've talked about the domestic front in China, and there's a reason for that. Uh, because I think that's the locus of where most of the action is going to be coming from. Uh, Todd Stern, the US climate envoy, likes to say that the Chinese and several other developing countries are willing to do considerably more than they are willing to agree to do. And I think that's absolutely right, and it's an important frame to keep in mind when you think about China on this issue. If you look at the Chinese stance, for example, in the UN climate negotiations, you would be hard pressed to understand what they are actually doing on the issue, because there is a real disconnect. They seem to have made a fundamental decision that their alignment is still with the G77 in that area. They focus on things like extracting cuts of 40% in emissions from developed countries, uh, getting those countries to put up 1% of their GDP for climate assistance, things that aren't going to happen, but that look good to their friends in the developing world. And again, I'd contrast that with India's move more recently, uh, the Indian environment minister coming out over the weekend, not intentionally, but saying their lot lies with the G20, not the G77 in the international climate negotiations, China seems to have cast its lot with the G77. They've been more constructive in bilateral settings with the EU and increasingly with the US, but ultimately there are limits to what can be done in those forums. Last basic point, which has come up as a theme throughout here. Uh, for China, climate is at least as much an issue of governance and of regulatory capacity as it is of interests and ambition. Uh, I talk a bit about how the interests often align, but that does not mean that they can necessarily execute. If you look at projections of what it would take for them to meet the goals that the world needs, they could probably do them at roughly net zero cost, but with a considerable amount of effort taken to move capital flows around domestically, to move investment patterns, things that are challenging and difficult for them to pull off. Uh, this is not just a matter of technical capacity, it's a matter of legal capacity, it's a matter of governance, political systems that allow you to actually have environmental laws passed and enforced and, uh, and followed through on. Um, and it's also an issue of central versus provincial and city control. We have this image often of China as having a very strong central government that makes all these different thing ha things happen. On energy, that's really not the case. There's a trend toward a little bit more central control, but ultimately decisions are made at a decentralized level, which makes it very difficult for China to engage at the international level.